Though cultural Marxism shared much of its philosophy with Marx, two other branches of ideology were on the horizon that would reject Marx almost entirely. The first began when a certain Austrian painter became Chancellor of Germany in 1933. Adolf Hitler, as leader of the National Socialist Party of Germany, was aware of Hegel's dialectic and the progress Marxism aimed to make. He believed that the uprising of the oppressed classes would result in a race war. In order to get ahead of that, his goal was to make Germany into an empire of superior men and rule the world from the ashes of the race war. Marx championed class socialism, and Hitler championed race socialism. Though Nazis and communists hated each other throughout World War II, make no mistake, they come from the same root. Another school of philosophy was formed in the Weimar Republic during the interwar period and came to America after being politically ousted from Germany. The school was called the Frankfurt School, and the philosophy they brought was called Neo-Marxism. Like the Nazis, the Neo-Marxists had an interest in race, and like Marx, they rejected the philosophy that came before them, including traditional Marxism itself, which they called vulgar Marxism. The leader of the school in the 1930s was called Max Horkheimer, and his most influential student was Herbert Marcuse. In 1937, Horkheimer published Traditional and Critical Theory, which in the history of CRT may as well be their Bible, as it makes a critical distinction that forms the foundation of their activism. Traditional theories, Horkheimer said, emphasize epistemic adequacy. Epistemology is the branch of philosophy concerned with how one comes to know something, so traditional theories are just hypotheses. You aim to know something, so you test a theory to get to that knowledge. Critical theories, however, try to change the world instead of trying to understand it. Critical theories try to pick at the threads of society to awaken that critical consciousness. The critical consciousness, again, is the awareness of the slave of his own dual consciousness as described by W.E.B. Du Bois. Even with a fulfilled and happy life, the slave is unaware of his true servitude. These theories are transformative, and they have at least three components. One, acknowledge issues within the system. Two, identify people able to make changes to the system. And three, set norms and standards for those people to follow to change the system. So you see, instead of just trying to know the world as it is, critical theories like CRT try to change the world. They have an activism component baked in. That's why Marxist teachers will claim they don't teach CRT in schools. That's true, they do CRT in schools. In summary, critical theories seek liberation from slavery. Critical race theory seeks liberation from race slavery. Critical gender theory seeks liberation from gender slavery. Critical math seeks liberation from mathematical slavery, and so on. A critical theory is always a transformative one. This was the beginning of neo-Marxism, but it wouldn't reach its height until the 1960s. Meanwhile, in 1947, Horkheimer wrote a book called The Dialectic of Enlightenment with Theodore Adorno. Neo-Marxists considered themselves a rebirth of Marxism, or the true path to enlightenment. They believed vulgar Marxism had lost its way and forgotten the Hegelian roots. Marx had focused too much on economy in his later work Das Kapital, so the neo-Marxists turned back to theories and ideas as Hegel had. Like Hegel, they were anti-enlightenment, meaning the rational enlightenment of the 1700s. They believed mythology was higher truth than reason, and that the plague of reason the enlightenment had started would eventually come back around to mythology. In 1950, Adorno went on to write his own terrifying book called The Authoritarian Personality, a book which you may never have heard of, though you've certainly been affected by it. He argued that right-wing politics were by definition authoritarian, and that left-wing politics, whatever they did, could never be the same since critical theories sought liberation. People fighting for liberation could never be authoritarian. Ever wonder why people with immense power can still claim victimhood? This is the book that started that reasoning. They can never be authoritarians and are therefore always the ones being oppressed and never the ones doing the oppression. Sam Harris recently said that it didn't matter what Hunter Biden had done, even if he had murdered children, it wouldn't be as bad as Trump University. Left-wing good, right-wing bad. This is Adorno in essence, even if Harris doesn't realize it. The aforementioned Herbert Marcuse wrote a book a few years later in 1955 called Eros and Civilization. While the neo-Marxists aimed to put Hegel back into Marx, Marcuse was aiming to bring Sigmund Freud in as well, arguing that capitalism suppressed the libido of the working classes, and that the sexual liberation and communism were inextricably linked. Here, he was channeling the thoughts of George Lukács and his sexual liberation, and so the dialectic progressed. 
Later in 1964, Marcuse argued that capitalism flattened society down into one dimension, which of course needed liberation. His book, One Dimensional Man, was advocating for the same kind of class awakening Marx championed over a century prior, but now the lines of stratification in society were different than economic class. They involved disparity in sexual liberty, power, race, and gender. The act of awakening to that reality is again called realizing your critical consciousness. In the words of the master-slave dialectic, the slave is being awakened to his reality, which capitalism apparently suppresses. Since everything is viewed in the lens of the master-slave dialectic, everything is described in terms of power dynamics. This is another crucial point for you to understand. Without grasping this, everything after this point might as well be Greek. Everything in neo-Marxism and its successive ideologies is steeped in power dynamics. The next year, in 1965, Herbert Marcuse published one of his most influential books, called Repressive Tolerance. In the pages of that book, Marcuse wrote of his belief that tolerance in society at that time allowed for too much oppression. The right wing, previously characterized by Adorno as authoritarian, was allowed to oppress the left wing too much. Those prevailing people and ideas, the hegemony of Gramsci's prison notebooks, deserved intolerance in order to balance the unequal power dynamic Marcuse diagnosed society with having. In the reverse, the oppressed people and ideas should get more tolerance, regardless of what they do, as they are simply fighting back against the system that's keeping them down. If you're looking for the source of the double standard in politics, you found it. The neo-Marxists believed people like Adolf Hitler could have been prevented from doing evil by being repressed earlier in life. Then, their aim was to forecast the future lives of people, find the ones who would potentially do evil, and submit them to repressive tolerance. If you've heard boys being called future rapists, you've heard repressive tolerance. The logic of repressive tolerance is what we live in today. Shortly after Marcuse's writings, three other major thinkers entered the scope of history in critical theory. In 1966, Michel Foucault wrote The Order of Things. In 1967, Jacques Derrida wrote Speech and Phenomena. And in 1968, H. George Fredrickson formulated his theory of social equity in public administration. Foucault created the postmodern knowledge principle. He believed knowledge was socially constructed in the service of power, created to benefit only the elite, whether intentionally or unintentionally. He called this thing power knowledge, but it's been immortalized by the phrase knowledge is power more recently, or rather, the ancient phrase has been co-opted. Also, he took the power dynamics of Marcuse one step further, writing that the relationship between power levels is more important than the knowledge of truth or falsity. This is similar to Nietzsche. If God is dead, and therefore the source of truth is no more, all that remains is power. Derrida's contribution to the movement was in deconstructionism. He believed that words and language couldn't convey true meaning, since any word just referred to one or more other words. Therefore, the search for meaning never ends. It's infinitely deferred. Why this is important is because Derrida argued that there can be no objective interpretation of any writing. The words on the page just refer to other words in our heads, which refer to yet other words, and so on. This is the essence of postmodernism, which claims no ultimate reason. Derrida also believed words came in male-female pairs, and to understand one word or phrase, you must use the paired word or phrase. Since history has largely been the telling of conquests of males, therefore the future is female. This was a big shift, since Derrida modified the dialectic of Hegel. Instead of merging a thesis with its antithesis to get something greater, Derrida picked apart the first two concepts and left the pieces on the floor. This is one reason why many Christians decide to leave Christianity after deconstructing their faith. They don't build faith back up again after taking it apart. Once faith is taken apart, if there's no reconstruction, why would you remain a Christian who relies on evidential faith? Under Derrida, there is no objective interpretation of the Bible, and faith gets picked apart and left on the floor. If this happens, we can make Jesus say whatever we want. H. George Fredrickson who worked in public administration, coined the term social equity theory in 1968. At the time, public administration stood on two pillars, efficiency and economy. Fredrickson offered social equity, today just known as equity, as a third pillar to be added. This forced equity, which is the neo-Marxist word for socialist state administration, into American public administration and turned the movement into a bureaucratic disease. Reaching the height of neo-Marxism in 1969, Horkheimer and Marcuse would make more large waves. Horkheimer gave a small speech on his critical theory of decades prior, reiterating the things he had said before, and Marcuse published his greatest book, An Essay on Liberation. 
If you remember that critical theories seek liberation, you'll see Horkheimer's influence on his prodigy. But first, a jump back in time. Just after the turn of the century, Teddy Roosevelt was president, and the United States was gripped by multiple powerful monopolies. If Marx had been right about capitalism leading into socialism, that would have been the moment the revolution would have happened. But, due to Roosevelt and Taft after him, that future never came. Instead of a proletariat uprising, the trusts were broken up and the lives of the lower class workers were greatly improved. Marcuse and Horkheimer recognized that Marx had been wrong. Unlike the cultural Marxists who agreed with Marx in principle but added to his philosophy, the neo-Marxists rejected him outright. In other words, they conceded that the American dream was real. But they still wanted their revolution, because even though the lower class Americans were satisfied with their lives, the neo-Marxists thought they were just deluded, that they just hadn't been awakened to their critical consciousness. So in order to do that, the dialectic progressed. Marxian class revolt was dead. Joseph Stalin's communist Russia had been a disastrous, deadly joke of an experiment, and old Marxism was now vulgar. Marcuse said we needed a new sensibility, or a new way of looking at the world. In other words, he was saying that real communism had never been tried. He believed that while the proletariat in Russia had revolted and taken over, because of their outdated sensibility, they became oppressors themselves and collapsed. This new sensibility would have to be identity-driven, and the target of his changing efforts would be the ghetto populations. The previous decades of brainstorming new avenues of liberation coalesced into this new sensibility, which is still going strong today, and the dialectic progressed. Three new things emerged at this time. Neo-Marxism fully emerged out of vulgar Marxism, and the Frankfurt School entered a new generation of leaders, but both of these would be eclipsed by the most influential movement, black feminism. Black liberation predated black feminism, and even got some traction in the 1940s and 50s, especially during wartime. Black soldiers were shown to be just as capable as white ones, but as everyone knows, it really caught wind in the 1960s with the likes of Martin Luther King Jr. at the helm. He became a celebrity around the world, and the cry for racial justice in America had never been stronger. At the same time, the second wave of feminism, led by Betty Friedan, was making waves in America like it had before in the 19th and early 20th centuries. However, the black female activists in feminism thought the civil rights movement was too focused on black men, and that the feminist movement itself was too focused on white women. So they decided to make their own movement, which was the most radical of them all. Of course, being influenced by the likes of Herbert Marcuse, they focused on things like racial capitalism, the idea that capitalism appropriates the labor of racial minorities, and the oppression of blacks during America's slavery years. The scholars that centered their studies on race and racial power conflicts would continue to fan the flame of revolution for decades to come. But in the course of this historical telling, they won't make a resurgence until 1986.